So thank you guys for coming today. Um, I hope this is useful. Um, so feel free to ask questions at any point, and I will try to remember to repeat them for the audience. So um, there is a saying, garbage in, garbage out. Um, it's true and unfortunate. Um, and it's really just that you want to get the most out of the samples that you're collecting from your patients, and you want to you know, not waste a sample, because certainly it's a, a valuable resource. So um, not all samples, unfortunately, that we get live up to what I call their diagnostic potential. So um, I'm going to be giving you tips today on sample um, preparation and collection, um, because that's really going to be important in trying to prevent some artifacts that we see that hinder the ability to um, interpret uh, these cases. So what we're going to do is try to go through hematology, chemistry, UA, body fluids, it's a lot. Um, but for each of these, just go through, like I said, some basic tips on collecting and preparing your samples, and then also include a case example for each of these. So starting with hematology, um, obviously you want to collect your sample into an EDTA tube. So EDTA is going to preserve the cellular morphology and allow um, to have storage of it and not have the cells degrade. It's also obviously uh, the anticoagulant that you use to prevent the sample from clotting. Um, before you even have uh, your sample get in the tube, you can have the possibility for in vitro hemolysis, which is gonna affect um, the accuracy of your results. So to try to prevent this, you wanna try to use you know, the biggest gauge needle that you can, obviously being practical um, and having good venipuncture techniques. So that's probably the main cause of platelet clumping is you know, um, issues with venipuncture. So trying to get a clean stick will certainly help and then when you're transferring your sample um, to a tube, it's helpful, so take off the cap, take off the needle. So if you push the sample through the needle, you're likely to lyse cells, and that's gonna be more um, damaging for them, rather than just going through the syringe and going through um, the tube without the cap on. And to avoid clotting, you obviously wanna do this kinda quickly, you don't wanna lollygag too much, so try to transfer that sample, and then just invert it or if you have you know, a tube rocker, set it on there. Um, no shaking, obviously, you wanna be gentle with the cells. And um, if the sample clots, unfortunately, you can't perform a complete blood count or an automated count of it um, because your cells are gonna be, um, you know, who knows how many cells are in those clots, so that's gonna affect it. But you can certainly still evaluate a blood smear and get a lot of information from that. So if you found, you know, as you collect the blood, you can put a drop on a slide, make a blood smear, um, and you can still estimate uh, cell counts and get a lot of information from a blood smear. So platelet clumping is probably the, you know, the nemesis of when you're trying to get an idea of platelet counts. Um, platelet clumping, as we know, can falsely decrease the count that you're gonna get from an analyzer, right? Because if they're in a clump, they're too big and the analyzer ignores it because it's larger than what it's told to consider is a platelet. So any count you get from an analyzer is gonna be a minimum. And then it's obviously gonna be harder to give a, an assessment of what do you think the platelet count is if you're judging, is this animal thrombocytopenic? And unfortunately, there's really no good equation that you can use of, you know, there's this many platelet clumps, therefore I'll add this number to whatever your estimate is. All you know is whatever you counted in the monolayer of the smear or whatever your analyzer has given you, all you know is that's your minimum, and then you have clumping in addition to that. So, I do say, though, that not all clumps are created equal in the sense of if you have a, a count or if you're estimating 30,000 in the smear and then there's one little clump, you're not going to have a normal platelet count. But if you're you know, estimating around 150,000 and there's lots of clumps, you know, cats especially have really um, sensitive platelets that like to clump um, pretty frequently. So that um, count is likely to be you know, bumped up into the normal range. Um, so, but if it's really uh, clumped and you really want an accurate count, unfortunately the best way is to just try to redraw. So um, there are some tips. Making a blood smear is one of the biggest one because there are things that happen in vitro in the tube. So if there's a delay, if you are sending out a sample to a lab to try to you know, verify what you're seeing, if there's more than a 24 hour delay um, in making a smear, running it through the analyzer, there are some effects that affect our ability to interpret them. So 
Um, shipping overnight can help to try to prevent this, but the biggest thing is making a smear. So if you make a smear at the time that you draw the blood and send that along with the tube, we can look at the blood smear and judge that, and then we also have your tube of blood. So most labs, it's not going to cost anything extra to look at the smear that you've given, and it's actually better than a smear that we would make after however long of the delay of shipping. So some of the things that happen with um, in vitro aging is the main thing is the red cells are going to swell. And if they you know, continue to swell and continue to hang out in the tube, eventually they could rupture. So that's going to affect um, your red cell count and potentially falsely lower it. Um, you can have swelling of white blood cells. So the nucleus actually of neutrophils will swell, and then the issue becomes, was that a segmented neutrophil that's just swollen because it's been sitting in a tube? Or is that actually a band neutrophil and this patient actually has a left shift and in an inflammatory leukogram? So those are important distinctions to make. And then obviously platelets like to clump all the time, so they're going to clump the more time that they spend in the tube. So with making a blood smear, you can use either a pipette or a little microhematocrit tube and just put a little drop of blood by the end of the smear there. And then you're going to take another slide at about a 30 to 40 degree angle or so draw it back into the drop of blood and then swiftly just make your smear. And the goal is to try to get essentially like an arrowhead or, you know, so you can have a feathered edge to examine on the smear. Okay. So in vitro aging, like we said, your red cells are going to swell. So that, if you basically have, this is our normal fresh sample. We have our red cells here and if you spin it down, and you measure a PCV or a spun hematocrit, you're going to have it here. And then if you have a sample that's aged, those sample or the red cells have taken on water, so they've swollen. So you can imagine if the cells have gotten bigger, they're gonna have a falsely increased MCV. It's the mean corpuscular volume, so their volume's bigger. And when you spin them down, it's actually going to be larger. So this is going to cause a, a false increase um, in a spun PCV. And then with them getting bigger, they're also gonna have the same amount of hemoglobin, but in a larger volume. So you're gonna have a dilutional false decrease in that MCHC. So in that scenario, if you're wondering, well, I can't believe my hematocrit here, and maybe the red cells have lice, the hemoglobin is still a good indicator of what is the oxygen comparing um, capacity of this animal. So a good kind of trick or rule of thumb is if you multiply the hemoglobin by three, that should give you a good estimate of the hematocrit. This is uh, an image here of a segmented neutrophil that's fresh, um, a blood smear that was made right after collection. And this is in comparison to a neutrophil that has sat in the tube and a blood smear made about a day after collection. So you can see that you have the nucleus that is swollen, and rather than having these nice segmentations, it's starting to mimic a band neutrophil. And one hint that you can see, and it may be hard with the lights, but you have some vacuoles that are very clear and discreet, and that is usually seen more with aging. So you're not gonna see that with toxic change if you're trying to judge that. The vacuolization that's in toxic change is much more frothy, um, so that's a, a hint that we'll use to say, mm, I think it's just age and probably not a true left shift. You can also see that the red cells are more um, echinocytic, so they're starting to creamy, whereas in the fresh smear, the cells, the red cells look more normal. Okay, so here's a video of one of the techs in our lab making a blood smear. She's far better at it than any of us. So she's just taking a microhematocrit tube and getting a small little drop of blood, putting it just away from the frosted edge of the smear there, and then taking the spreader slide back into the drop and then a swift motion forward. And she's kind of creating, you can see a nice, um, again, that kind of oval shape at the edge to have a nice feathered edge. And the biggest problem I would think when people are you know, trying to get better at it, especially when I see our students trying to make blood smears for the first time, is they come back, and then they just go really slow as they're making their blood smear and just kind of nervous. So the best thing is just back and forward and just making that a swift motion. And the slower you go forward, the more it has kind of waves in it um, as you go. 
So some tips if you're having, if you're frustrated with your blood smears, um, they often, you know, are, they're either too short or they're too long. Um, and if it's too long, it's going to go right off the edge of the smear. And that feathered edge is really important to look for things like platelet clumps um, or infectious agents, things like that. So if you find that you have a smear that's too short and it's just, you know, super short, it's likely that the angle of your sweater slide is too high, right? So you're just doing this. So if you decrease that angle, you'll have a longer smear and vice versa. If you're going off the edge of the smear, it's likely that you don't have enough of an angle and it's just going right off. So if you increase that angle a bit, you'll get a nice smear. Okay, so I have a digital slide of a normal dog blood to just go through and kind of give you our systematic approach for how we evaluate a blood smear. Because I imagine you guys are often the ones that are doing this or, you know, hey, check a platelet count for me. And it's always, I'm sure, quick on the fly. Um, so just to kind of give you our approach. So we always start at the feathered edge. And you can kind of see um, it's very pale there with the lighting. But this is the feathered edge um, out here. So we like to start there because if any of you work in the south, obviously that's where microfilaria like to hang out. So you're going to want to look for them there. Sometimes also white blood cells that have an anaplasma morula will sometimes only be out at the feathered edge. So it's a good place to look for infectious agents. Um, larger cells, sometimes mast cells, that's the only place they'll be. So it's um, prudent to just kind of cruise along the feathered edge and get a feel for what's out there. In a normal animal, not much. A couple of white blood cells. And you don't want to spend um, too much time worrying about the morphology of the cells out there because they're often going to be ruptured. They're right at the edge. Um, but you'll also see platelet clumps out here, things like that. Um, normally, you're just going to have low numbers of white blood cells. If you sense that there are a lot of white blood cells at the feather, then that's probably going to already give you an indication that this patient has a leukocytosis or a high white count. So after you kind of go along at the feathered edge, then you want to go into the monolayer of the smear. So at 10x, what you're going to do is basically, I often find it's two turns in. Now this is more than two clicks that I can do at a time. Um, but you want to get to the point of the smear where all the red cells are kind of evenly spread. They're just about touching if you have a normal hematocrit for the patient. You can see that we do have some amounts of, of white space between them, but not much. So this, on the other hand, is what I kind of call like the no man's land, where you're in between the feather and the monolayer, and the red cells are going to be distorted in dogs that normally have central pallor to their red cells. They're now going to lose that, so you don't want to overinterpret things here. And it's also um, challenging to tell cell density because they're not evenly spread in this area. So as we come back to the monolayer of the smear, at 10x, what we're doing here is really judging the cell density. So we kind of get a feel for the white cell density as well as the red cell density. So for the white cell density, all of these guys here with nuclei, and granted this is a mammal, if you're looking at bird or reptile blood, this bet is off because it's just too many nuclei for your eye. But if you're judging, you know, how many uh, white blood cells there are. And again, this is a normal dog to get a feel for normal. So we use the chocolate chip cookie analogy. So this is a chocolate chip cookie, and here are your chocolate chips. So if it looks like a pretty normal cookie, you probably have a normal white blood cell count. If it looks like a really well-endowed cookie, then you likely have a leukocytosis. And if it looks like a sugar cookie and you're not really seeing any white cells in your field of view, you likely have a leukopenia. So that's just our really quick, and if you like to play the game, you know, we try to guess the white count. Like, I don't know, 10,000. Usually on Monday we're awful and on Fridays we're better, um, but it's a fun game to play. So that's your white cell density. And then for red cell density, basically you're getting a feel for the amount of white space. So are all the red cells touching? Or do they look like they're really squished together and you can't even find a good area that seems like a monolayer? If they're really squished, it's likely that the patient is polycythemic. So whether or not that's a relative polycythemia because they're dehydrated and it's just hemoconcentrated or a true polycythemia. But if it seems like a really dense smear, it's likely that there is a high hematocrit. 
Whereas if you have white space, it's likely that you have an anemic patient. And then you're just trying to get a feel, does it look like a little bit of white space, a moderate amount, or is it really dispersed in the sense that it's a red cell here, a red cell here, a red cell here, and they're nowhere near each other. And then that's gonna tell you you have a severe anemia. So that's just all a 10x impression of how things are spaced out. And then once you have that done, we usually go to either 40, if you have that on your scope, it's a high dry lens, or if you have a 50X, that's gonna be an oil lens. So at 40 or 50X, what you're gonna do then is look at your white cells. No one's gonna expect you to sit there with a counter and do a diff, um, but what you wanna really look at is your neutrophils and say, am I seeing banned neutrophils? Am I seeing toxic change? And just kind of cruise around. And this is actually, whoop, we'll go back. That's a good example. This cell is actually just ruptured. It just got smudged. So you're going to skip it. And you're not going to try to figure out what it was in its past life. That happens. So you just move on from that. And kind of cruise around. And right here we have a monocyte next to a neutrophil. So that's another good side-by-side um, -side comparison there. So monocytes tend to be a little bit bigger than neutrophils. They're gonna have a more diffusely blue cytoplasm, whereas neutrophils are pinker. The challenge sometimes becomes distinguishing banned neutrophils that are toxic from monocytes, and that can be a pain. Um, monocytes are gonna tend to have more of those discrete bubbles. Like I said, neutrophils will have when they're aged, but not toxic. So if you're seeing very discrete, almost like fat-like bubbles in a cell that's diffusely blue, it's likely more to be a monocyte, whereas Neutrophils that are banded and toxic, they're gonna have more streaky blue cytoplasm, more frothy evacuation. You may see delay bodies, those little blue to gray pinpoint dots in the cytoplasm. So um, that's, those are some tips for distinguishing those. Um, and monocytes, again, are, tend to be a little bit bigger than your neutrophils. So normal monocyte there, you're just kind of cruising around. Obviously, you would want to take note if there's a cell that looks big and you're like, I don't know what that is, but it doesn't look normal. You know, that would be something to take note of. Um, but that's essentially what you're doing. And then, you know, like I said, you're not really going to be doing a differential, but you can get an idea for cell proportions. You know, in our small animals, neutrophils should be the most predominant. So if you're going around and all you're seeing is lymphocyte, 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 and you're not really finding neutrophils, then maybe that patient is neutropenic especially if that cell density looked decreased. So you can get an idea of, if I'm not seeing many neutrophils, maybe I'm concerned that's decreased. Or if you tend to see, if you're like eosinophil, 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 then that's gonna suggest that it's increased. I mean, in a typical differential, we're seeing maybe 1% eosinophils, maybe none. And basophils are like the endangered species that we, you know, you never see, and you, if you see it, you're excited. So if you're seeing a lot of eos and basos, again, that's just a general impression. You can say, you know, hey, I think this animal has an eosinophilia, maybe then, you know, it's a flea, uh, cow with fleas, or other parasites that that could um, at least suggest that. So, um, so that's what you're going to do at kind of 40 to 50x, and then you'll go closer to 100x, and that's where we're going to judge. Uh, red cells and platelets. So if you have an anemia, the first question that the vet's going to ask is, is it regenerative? Do you think it's regenerative? So you're going to look for polychromatophils, so those larger cells that are more purple. Um, in this case, again, being a normal dog, you can kind of see the spacing between them to get an idea of, you know, this animal's not anemic. Um, so you're going to also look at red cell morphology to see if there's anything that can help you try to figure out if the animal's anemic. Are you seeing big Heinz bodies in a cat, or are you seeing spherocytes in a dog and maybe concerned about IMHA, things like that. So red cell morphology can tell you a lot, um, but in dogs, these are nice normal red cells that have central pallor. Cats ten tend to have a little bit less central pallor to their red cells. And then for your platelets, platelets are the forgotten cells in the background. I feel like if you haven't looked at a smear in a while, you're like, what are the platelets? Oh yeah, those are the platelets. So, no nuclei, but you know they're platelets because they have these purple granules in the cytoplasm. Um, so if you're worried about a patient that's thrombocytopenic, you're basically, this is the thing to take the time to count and do, whether or not you have a little tally sheet next to your scope. But count in a field and move to the adjacent field, count many platelets, 
adjacent field, and then you can kind of go up, 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 and then over, down, 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 and just try to stay in the monolayer, because if you're too far back, you could overestimate the platelet density. So you want to get an average of 10 fields or so, and then that average, multiply that by 15,000, and that's going to give you your platelet estimate. So if you're seeing zero to two platelets in a 100x field, then you know that you're in that kind of danger zone of 30,000 platelets or less. And that's when we worry about spontaneous bleeding, animals that just may have spontaneous gingival bleeding or subcutaneous bleeding, things like that. If you're in the 50,000 range, that's when usually we're concerned about surgical bleeding. So if you make an incision, if you try to do a surgery, that animal may not clot appropriately. And then above that is usually more in a safe area. And for us, you know, 180,000 is the low end of our normal kind of reference interval for dogs and cats. So that's about 12 platelets in a high power field. So if you're counting, if you get to 10 and you're still going, you're fine. So if it's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 10, next one over 10, you're good. But it's really when those more of the low numbers that you're like, I'm going to be diligent and count and make sure and see what um, the platelet estimate is. I will show you um, an abnormal case here for fun to compare. So this is the monolayer of a dog that is not normal. So you can kind of easily see the difference in the red cell density. That's probably the most striking thing, right? So as we said, you're going to look at the amount of white space. This is a ton of white space, right? So this is a severe anemia. And for me, when I'm kind of ballparking, I think of mild as in like the 30s, moderate in the 20s, and severe being in the teens or lower for the hematocrit. So this is, I would say, easily like a hematocrit somewhere in the teens, maybe even you know, 10, 8, something like that. So real severe. Um, and as you go closer, your eye can sometimes be fooled when you're judging white cell density because you can often have these guys with a regenerative anemia. So anyone know what that cell is there? Exactly, a nucleated red blood cell. So at low power sometimes you'll think like, oh yeah, the white cell density is real high. But a lot of those can be nucleated reds that trick your eye. So something to keep an eye on. And then again, this is your polychromatophil here. So a larger cell, it's got a purple hue to it um, versus this being a more normal cell. And then these are actually um, a different cell, red cell, but a different morphology, like these guys here. Anyone want to venture a guess what those guys are? They're a bit denser, hard to see. Again, if that one has a normal amount of central pallor, these guys aren't really displaying a central pallor. They look a bit smaller and denser almost. So these are actually spherocytes. So again, just keep in mind, a dog should be a biconcave disc where you see a bit of central pallor when you're looking at it, you know, kind of a top view. So spherocytes appear smaller, denser, and if you have a, you know, a patient that's anemic, it looks like it's regenerative, you've got a lot of polychromation, then you're seeing all these smaller cells that look denser. Um, then that's certainly um, uh, going to be consistent with a, an IMHA uh, patient. And again, there's NRBC next to some spherocytes and, and polychromatophils. So in patients that are anemic and maybe you're suspicious of an IMHA because you're like, you know what, I really think I'm seeing spherocytes and this dog otherwise fits the picture clinically, you may be wondering, is this animal agglutinating? And sometimes you can see macroscopically, either on the slide or in the tube on the edge, it looks like it's you know, got um, clumps there. But sometimes you can't tell um, macroscopically. And we can do what's called a wet prep or a saline prep to look for microscopic agglutination. And what you do, it's super quick and easy. You basically just mix one drop of blood and just get any sort of plastic tube. One drop of blood to about three to four drops of saline. You can make it you know, more or less dilute. And then take a plastic pipette or whatever to mix up that solution or invert it a bit. And then you take a drop of that mixture, put it on a slide, put a cover slip over it, put it on your scope to look at. There's no staining or anything. And then you lower the condenser down to look at it the same way you would look at a urine sediment that isn't stained. And then basically, you're, you're just going to see these red cells kind of like floating along and they're just going to be moving in this saline mixture and it's actually really beautiful. 
Um, and if there is Rouleau on this smear, and Rouleau are when the red cells stack up like coins, right? And we usually see that when there's high globulins, which certainly a patient with IMHA often has inflammation and high globulins. So this is a useful tool to distinguish Rouleau from agglutination. So with Rouleau, the saline will be able to successfully disperse those red cells, and they won't touch, and they'll just float around as individuals. Whereas if you do have agglutination, what you'll actually see is globs of red cells of different sizes. So if you've got really big um, conglomerates of red cells, you may just see it at 10x, and you'll see a ball of red cells and a ball of red cells, and at 10x, you'll be like, whoa, and that's certainly agglutinating. And again, the saline should disperse Rouleau, but it won't agglutination. So if you're not convinced, dilute it more, add another drop of saline, because it's pretty cool when you first see it. And then you may not see it at 10x, and you may have to go closer to like 40x. And it may just be that like three red cells are stuck together, or four red cells. So it may not be this large. Um, but again, red cells shouldn't stick. Like maybe as they're floating, they like bump into a neighbor, and then they you know, move in a different direction. But if they're consistently moving together, then that's not normal. So that tells you that, yeah, this patient does have agglutination. So a really easy thing that you can do and doesn't take long at all. So um, when we get samples in any referral clinical pathology lab, we use what's called a rate stain. And that's different from DIFQUIC. So any practice, any shelter is going to have DIFQUIC staining, right? It's the quick one in the three different solutions, whereas what we use is an automated stainer. Basically allows us to like line up 20 slides and walk away from it and it just does its thing. And First time I saw it, I thought it was amazing. So, um, but it tends to be, it's more expensive. You have to change out the stains more frequently. Um, so that's why it's not practical or really used in any other setting other than a laboratory. So we often, we prefer right stain. So if you're sending in a, a blood smear, we always say, please send us an unstained one. Um, but if you're looking at DIFQUIC, I will give props. DIFQUIC is better at this particular thing. So you can kind of see, on the right stain, and again, the lining's challenging, but there's a little something in that neutrophil, which on the diff quick becomes a little more obvious. And that is a certain inclusion of an infectious agent that dogs get. Anyone want to take a venture a guess? So it's actually something we see not commonly at all. It's actually distemper inclusion. And you can also see these inclusions in red cells. And again, on the diff quick, they're much more easy to see in a parent. And it's like, basically, there's a little something in that red cell there. So we normally use right stains. So that's another reason why it's really important to write a history. We always encourage that with submissions. And even for CBCs, I feel like often people are better with a cytology actually writing a history. But for a CBC, a history is just as valuable. If you tell us the clinical signs and we're like, huh. If you're, say, you know, suspicious of December, we will you know, intentionally stain a smear with DIFQUIC to look for that because the stain just picks up the inclusions that much more readily. So you see these inclusions in the acute phase of the infection, and they're only in blood for transient times. So we don't see them commonly, but when you do, it's diagnostic, and it definitely helps out in those cases. OK, so a case example here, um, we have Sparky, a one-year-old male chihuahua that has an acute onset of severe diarrhea and vomiting, moderately dehydrated, and has an in-house parvo test that is positive. So blood was submitted for CBC in a small amount in a three mil purple top tube. So we have here um, an abbreviated CBC panel. So we have a low hematocrit, mildly decreased, um, normal hemoglobin and red cell, a low MCV, a high MCHD, um, and then a low white count there. So the white count, in my mind, I can explain, right? Because certainly your parvo dogs often are neutropenic or leukopenic. So what do you guys think? Would you be able to say, do you think this patient is anemic based on this CBC? So there's a couple, it's a little bit contradictory, right? So your hematocrit is low, which is you know, usually what you kind of go to. But in general, if you have an anemic patient, the hematocrit, hemoglobin, and the red cell count, or the number of red cells, should all kind of go in unison. So they should all be low if you have an anemic patient. Or if it's polycythemic, they should all be high. So 
if you ever have kind of one doing one thing and the other ones are within the reference interval, that should kind of be a little, you know, alarm that something's maybe not right. Another kind of um, alarm bell is the MCHC being high. So the MCHC is the mean cellular hemoglobin concentration. And so can you ever think, the red cells typically never make more hemoglobin than they need to, right? They make enough and they may have a low MCHC if they're a bigger cell. So like a polychromatophil, when you have regenerative anemias, you often have an increased MCV and a low MCHC because polychromatophils are bigger. But again, it's the same amount of hemoglobin. So you never have a high MCHC that's not an artifact. So that should be, if you ever see a high MCHC, it's either that the sample's lipemic maybe and the interference of just the spectral um, measurement of that is interfered with. But a high MCHC should be kind of another little alarm bell that something's maybe not right. So, and if you have a low MCV, um, that could cause you to have you know, a higher MCHC, right? The same cells, the same amount of hemoglobin, but if it got smaller for some reason, it's gonna seem like there's more hemoglobin in it. So anyone have an idea of what may have caused this to happen? Think about it. Excellent, good. So this little hint here, so less than a mil, but in a full size, this isn't a microtainer, a full three mil EDTA tube. So it's exactly right. You have basically too much EDTA for the amount of blood that's in the sample. So we call that a short sample. So what happens in this, and this is a common artifact, especially cats or animals that you know, you're just trying to get a little bit of blood out of. So again, the same kind of thing. This is your normal scenario. If you spin this down, here's your PCV and your normal red cells. This time, think of EDTA as being hyperosmolar. So it has a greater tonicity than the red cell. So now what's going to happen is the water from the red cell is going to want to leave the red cell to go into this more hypertonic solution to try to equilibrate, right? So the water is leaving the red cell and it just becomes shrunken. So it becomes smaller. So you have these red cells that are now shrunken because they've lost water out into this hyperosmolar environment. And you spin that down and you're going to have a falsely decreased hematocrit. So basically, this is what we were seeing in that case. So you have a low MCV. And another thing is it's pretty uncommon to have a low MCV. And the most common thing we see it with is actually iron deficiency. So if there's no other indication that this patient would be iron deficient, that should be another like, hmm, that's weird. The only other thing you see it with really are shunt dogs. So if it has a portosystemic shunt or iron deficiency, those are your main two thoughts for a low MCV. But in an otherwise, you know, kind of normal looking chihuahua, you wouldn't think that. So you have um, a falsely increased MCHC, and then the hematocrit is a calculated value, so it's not measured. That PCV, if you spin it down, that is measured, but the hematocrit takes into account the MCV. So because your MCV is low, that's gonna affect your hematocrit. So again, if you multiply that hemoglobin by three, that'll give you a good estimate of the hematocrit. So, the way to avoid this is by using microtainers. They're going to have a smaller amount of EDTA in them and less likely to cause this artifact. Okay, moving on to chemistry. So chemistry, you want to collect into a red top tube. That's going to allow the sample to clot. And if you're ever sending out a panel, you really want to aim for a mil. And if you have less than a mil, it's a really good idea to write down what are your priority values. Like if you're really worried about kidney disease, say, hey, BU and creatinine, those are the ones I want. Because otherwise the labs, you know, they may run what they're able to and the rest will say quantity not sufficient. Um, so a mil is kind of your goal. And if you have less than that, you know, let us know. Liver values, is that what you care about? And it's really important to separate the serum prior to shipping. So letting that sample clot, spinning it down, removing the serum from the red cells, and then sending us that. Because there are artifacts that occur if the serum just sits on the cells, because the red cells are going to continue doing what they do. They're going to continue metabolizing, and they're also going to leach out things that are within them. So things that can be falsely increased if the sample has sat is potassium, and that's going to be in large animals, not small animals, but in certain small animals like Akitas, you know, it's like 
the cool breeds. So they have high potassium red cells. So they'll actually have a falsely increased potassium if those red cells sit. And then AST, one of the enzymes we think of more with liver, it actually is also within red cells. So it can be falsely increased if the red cells are sitting on the serum. And then the flip side, the biggest thing that we worry about is the glucose. So the red cells are going to continue metabolizing. They're going to take up the glucose in the serum and they're going to use it for energy source. So you're going to have a falsely decreased glucose. So if you have a patient that looks totally normal and the glucose is 30, you know, and the animal's not seizuring, it's likely going to be an artifact and not real. Okay, so case example here, we have Brady, a two-year-old male castrated blue tick hound that has neurologic signs. And what we have here, we have a high potassium um, that's markedly increased at 11.4. Um, we have a high anion gap. We've got a very low calcium, not even measurable low magnesium as well as iron, and then this is the total iron binding capacity. Not a lot of labs give iron values, but um, we do an iron panel standard at Cornell. So do we think that this dog's uh, neurologic signs are, can be explained by this chem panel? Would you guys have any concerns with these results before you handed them over to the vet? So for one thing, this calcium, there are some things that we just call like not compatible with life, you know, like glucose of like zero or, you know, a calcium that's not measurable. So there are some things you can kind of use common sense and be like, okay, even if you're having neurologic signs, you should have a measurable calcium. And if it's less than even detectable by the analyzer, that should make you scratch your head and be like, mm, that, that's concerning. Another thing is this potassium is real bad. That's real high. So the, probably the cases where we see a hyperkalemia the most are like a blocked cat. So if they're not able to urinate, their potassium is going to build up, build up, build up. And what do blocked cats like to do if they don't get relieved of their obstruction? In my case, they like to die. <laughs> so if you don't relieve that obstruction, that potassium is going to build up, build up, build up. Their heart is going to slow down, slow down, slow down, and they will arrest and die. So potassium in this quantity is very dangerous. So if this dog is not bradycardic and, you know, not showing any cardiovascular signs, that should be a red flag as well. So kind of those two values are the ones that should be like, hmm, that, that seems not compatible with what I'm seeing in this patient. So can you guys think of what may have caused these results on the theme of artifacts of what may have resulted in this? So calcium being low, Potassium being high, also magnesium, iron or low too. So this is a sample that we got that was submitted in EDTA. So if you collect a sample, you know, tubes, it's busy, it's crazy, you grab the wrong one and you submit it in, or if you collect it in the EDTA, these are the type of results you're going to see. So if you think about it, EDTA is the anticoagulant that we prefer to use for hematology testing. And the way it works is it chelates or it binds up calcium. And calcium is needed for all the coagulation reactions to happen, right? So it not only chelates um, calcium, but anything else that's a divalent cation. So it's also going to bind up magnesium and then iron. So those two values were also kind of bottomed <laughs> out on those results. Another thing is that EDTA is often present if you see it's like K2 EDTA or K3 EDTA. So it's present with potassium in the mixture. So that is now introducing all this extra potassium into the sample. So these are a common pattern that if you see those changes, you want to be like, oh crap, did I, did I put it in the wrong tube? And it's better to you know, realize it and see these things and say, you know what, nope, I can explain this. You don't have to go measuring an ionized calcium or anything. This is not compatible with life, you can say. Less than zero, it's not living. OK. So for your analysis, you want to collect that into a red top tube. You want to shoot for like 10 mils, but hey, you get what you get. And you want to try to collect a separate tube for culture, because you don't want to be taking you know, samples out or mixing it, introducing a pipette, if that's going to be the sample that you're going to culture. And you want to, um, if you're performing cytology, make a fresh smear. So if potentially you're concerned about an animal that may have a transitional cell carcinoma or something and you want to 
make um, a cytology smear, you want to make that right away because urine is a horrible place for cells to live. It causes them to degrade. So the longer that cells are sitting in urine, it's going to make them harder for us to see because they're just going to start to die. So I will show you guys how to make a line smear. So that's a really quick and easy tool to use for urine cytologies. And if you ever want cytology, you want to make sure you write that in the request form separate from just a standard urinalysis. And it's also really important to tell us how it was collected. So we're going to interpret very differently a free catch from a cysto, from if you did a traumatic catheterization. We're going to expect different things in each of those. And always a history is welcome and important. So for a line smear, what you're going to do is basically the same as a blood smear. Just put a drop of urine near the frosted edge and then take a slide, come back into that drop and make go out. But instead of making a nice feathered edge, you're going to stop and lift straight up. So basically stopped abruptly and lift and that creates a line and it's going to concentrate the cells along that line. So it's an easy way to concentrate it without centrifuging. You can centrifuge and make a cytology of the sediment, but it's a quick, easy tool to use. Okay, so a urinalysis case. This is August, an adult male castrated mixed breed dog, um, a stray that was found ataxic, lethargic, and weak. Once it was brought to you, it started vomiting, and you've done a chemistry panel, and you see that there's marked increases in the urea nitrogen and creatinine, and you obtained a catheterized urine sample, because you want to at least check that USG. So you're looking at the urine sediment, and we've got some red cells here. And a fun way to know it's a red cell is if it ever becomes like an echinocyte, or if it, you know, crenates like that. White cells don't do that. So it's a, a nice way to know if, if it looks like an echinocyte, it's a red cell. So we've got these crystals here, and here's a higher magnification view of them. So these crystals, anybody know what they are? Which I often have to look up crystals because I don't look at them frequently. So I'm going to take you to a nice helpful place. If you haven't heard, um, so we have a website called eclinpath.com. It's kind of the brainchild of Dr. Tracy Stokel. She's constantly adding things to it, new information. It's a really helpful source for everything, CBC chem, urine, cytology. If you're like hypercalcemia, I don't remember, or you know, what sample do I submit for this? It's a great place to go to. So I particularly love it for urine because I can't remember what crystals look like because I don't look at it enough. So, this is what we call our little quick guide here. So for all the crystals, whether they be common or uncommon. So one way to help narrow down what type of crystal it is, is to use the pH to help you. Because certain crystals only really form in acidic urine versus alkaline urine, sometimes neutral, so that's not helpful. Um, but the pH can be a first step to help. And then kind of comparing, and we play match the picture all the time when we're seeing something we haven't seen before or trying to match it up. So if we remember what those look like, we're kind of going through, and, and maybe those, right, they looked elongated. They look more like these, right? They kind of look like they had a pointed end. And the biggest difference between this one here and the struvite up here, you can kind of appreciate how the struvite is like three-dimensional. It's almost like a coffin, um, so to speak. And the one, the calcium oxalate monohydrate is more 1D. So it's not going to have more of a three, like this is coming out at you and then making a line. It's just going to be one dimensional. It's often kind of termed a picket fence. So if it looks like that. So that, if we say, fits with our patient. So we have calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals. So like I said, they're the kind of same elongate shape. They're not round, they're not square like struvite, but they're going to be one dimensional instead of um, 3D like struvite. So these form often with ethylene glycol toxicity. And it kind of fits, right? Ethylene glycol causes renal failure. So if you have this patient, has a high BUN creatinine, they're vomiting, it causes GI irritation. Um, these crystals are, if you see them, Highly, highly suggestive 
but you won't always see them. So they're not going to be in 100% of cases, but when you do, it certainly helps make that diagnosis. And we see ethylene glycol toxicity when animals get into antifreeze. So more of a winter thing, but certainly if it's out in the garage at any time, um, animals can be exposed. So for urine sediment exam, I kind of always refer back here. So whether it be cells or if you're you know, wondering about pH or different measurements on the dipstick, we kind of go through each of those and it's nicely outlined there. So moving on to body fluids. You're going to collect them, so body fluids being if you have peritoneal effusion or pleural effusion, if you're collecting those um, for cytology, again, put them in the EDTA because that's what helps to preserve cells, but EDTA inhibits bacterial growth. So you don't want to submit an EDTA tube for culture. You're going to want to make sure you collect a red top tube for culture, as well as if you're going to run any chemistry tests. So say you're worried about an animal that's potentially ruptured its bladder and you want to measure creatinine, we compare that to the blood, you're going to want to measure the creatinine on a red top tube of the effusion, not a purple top tube. And as always, make a smear at the time of collection for these fluids. Because on cytology, when we're evaluating them, there are certain things that can happen in the tube because these cells are still pretty much doing their thing and they can live. So they can phagocytize bacteria as well as red cells. So if you're worried, is this a septic abdomen or is there just some bacterial contamination, if that tube sits for a while and it can eat bacteria within like 30 minutes. So if it's sitting and then now you're looking at a smear and there's bacteria in the neutrophil, we're wondering, okay, is that real or is that um, just from it phagocytizing in the tube? So that's why it's really important to make a smear right away. Also, the cells can swell, and so it's hard to tell degenerate from a non-degenerate neutrophil, again, helping you to distinguish is it an infectious uh, process or not. And then bacteria can really start to overgrow in time as they sit in the tube. Okay, so you want to make sure if you're submitting um, fluids to us, you don't want to submit an already centrifuge sample, um, but submit just a straight up one for us to do cell counts. But things you can do just in-house when you have that sample is, number one, look at the color. So if it looks pretty clear and you can read a newspaper through it, it's likely to have a low cell count and likely to be a transitative effusion. Or if it looks really opaque and you can't read anything through it, and if it, especially if it's like flocculent with little chunkies, it's likely going to be an exudative effusion or an inflammatory process. Um, and the line smear technique, here's the diagram. So taking that drop, pulling the slide back, stopping and lifting straight up. And again, that can concentrate cells on a line here. So that can be a way to look at an effusion quickly because if you're having a, you know, something that looks relatively low cellularity, just a regular direct smear isn't going to have a lot of cells on it. You can also measure the protein. And at 2.5 is kind of our cutoff. So if it's lower than 2.5, then it tells you it's a low protein, so a transidate. And if it's higher than 2.5, it's either going to be a modified transidate or an exudative effusion. So you can measure that just on the refractometer. And if it's, again, kind of a clear looking fluid, you can just measure it straight off the fluid. If it's something opaque and flocculent, you'll want to spin it down, centrifuge it, and measure the protein on the supernatant. So you'll have a cell pellet at the bottom just measure, take a drop of the supernatant on top and put that on your refractometer. And that'll give you an idea of the protein. Okay, so here's a fun cytology case of an effusion. This was of a dog that presented in respiratory distress and had um, fever and we got pleural fluids. So we have, this is a direct smear, so it's highly cellular and lots of cells on here. Probably hard to see what they are at this point. If we look a bit closer, you can kind of see that these are all neutrophils. They're just really frothy and they don't look as nice as they do in blood. You've got some red blood cells, there are some macrophages there. And we've also got the cause of the effusion here. Does anybody want to venture a guess of what's causing this dog's problem? So we've got some things in here that aren't cells and it almost looks like the cells are trying to attack it. They're in globs. So we've got two little buddies here and two up here. They're blue, almost looks like they have a wall. And then here you can almost see them budding. They bud from like a broad base. 
So they're too big to be bacteria. Bacteria would basically be like within a neutrophil or similar size, and if it's a rod, maybe it'll be thin, but for a cocci, way too big. So way too big to be bacterial cocci. What these are are actually yeast. So they're fungal organisms. And this is blastomyces. So blastomycosis is more common in the Midwest, especially like Wisconsin area, but we see it here every now and then. And you can see it in fluids, you can see it in urine, you can see it in fecal cytology, you can get an aspirate from a mass. So you can see it, and when you see this, it's diagnostic. I mean, go for it if you want a fungal culture, but it, it has a very classic appearance. So it's something to keep an eye if you're like, I don't know, I'm seeing these blue things. And if you're like, it's bigger than bacteria, you want to be thinking, could this be a fungal organism? So that can certainly cause and mimic bacterial infections. Okay, so submission form, always important to give us a good history. I know you guys are often the ones stuck writing these things, so you know, make sure, just corner the vet and be like, tell me what you want me, you know, what are the clinical signs? Or if you guys don't write them down, tell us, you know, what does the mass look like? How big is it there? You know, how big is it? Things like that. Um, any relevant lab results. So if you're sending us urine, tell us if the animal's azotemic or vomiting or things like that. And with shipping, Always important to keep fluids, including blood, refrigerated. Um, this was something we got, and we're like, that cold pack is doing nothing for that over there. They were just like totally separate. So make sure they're nice and intimate, except for slides. Slides you don't want to refrigerate. So yes, refrigerate the tube of blood. Slides, just keep them at room temp. No refrigeration, don't touch ice. And also it's important if you're sending in a surgical biopsy that's in a jar of formalin, to keep slides away from that because the formalin fumes, even if you think the jar is tight, if it's ever any fumes getting out, they can actually affect the staining property of the cells. And um, try not to send us, sometimes we get like needles and scalpel blades in the mail. We're like, huh? So try not to send us any sharps. You know, make your smears with the scalpel blade first. We appreciate that, especially uh, the receiving folks in our text. So, so protecting the slides. We can, our techs are pretty crafty with like taping a slide under it, but sometimes if it's in shards, it's too far gone. So these cardboard protectors are okay as long as you pack it well, you know, keep them protected. Also these plastic um, slide holders are good. Um, and this is what can happen when you refrigerate um, a slide of blood. Um, these white cells, they're just kind of swelling, swelling. They can lice, the red cells can lice. Sometimes it's just a pink background and no red cells at all. Same things happen when samples freeze, which we had this winter. Um, all the red cells just pop. And then with formalin, the cells just take on this. When we put it through our stainer, they just get this blue, hazy, greenish like color. And it makes it really hard, especially in cytology, where color is so important. Um, so keeping in mind either shipping them separately or putting that formalin jar in a plastic bag that's sealed just so they don't um, exude their fumes everywhere. Okay, so if there's ever a time where you're like, how much do I submit? I don't know, sample submission questions. Our website's super helpful. You just go to the HDC or Animal Health Diagnostic Center, and then if you click on lab sections, um, you'll see ClinPath. And we've got information on reference intervals as well as sample submission guidelines, um, all sorts of helpful information there. Um, and then, again, I would recommend bookmarking this page because I think it's really helpful. And we also have a fun, right up here in the right-hand corner, a case of the month where you can just test yourself. And we put together, we just share fun cases that we see, be it hematology, blood smears, or cytologies, or urines, or whatever. And we'll give you the case signalment, pictures, and then you can test yourself and, and read about it. So it's just kind of a fun monthly thing to do. Okay, and that's it, and these are my pets. <laughs>